Today is day 27. We are in Acts 27. Uh, we just have uh, today and tomorrow, and that's it. So we're in the home stretch. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll look at Acts uh, chapter 27. God, thank you for today and for this weekend and an opportunity to get recharged and to spend time with family and friends and neighbors and uh, a weekend to celebrate dads. God, we thank you for what you've been teaching us through your word and this journey we've been on through the book of Acts. And so as for now and for chapter 27, God, we pray that you'd open our eyes to see what you want us to see. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right. Verse 1, chapter 27, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, all right, so it was decided Paul um, appeals to Caesar, so he's heading to Rome, all right, so he, he's heading to see the big guy. Uh, so when it was decided um, that that was going to happen, that they began to uh, sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to the to a centurion named Julius, who who belonged to the imperial imperial gosh imperial regiment. That's that's a, lot, a little bit harder to, to say than I anticipated. And, and the imperial regiment was really valuable to the Caesar, especially during times of, of of war. So Julius is this guy who's about to be in charge of, in essence, getting a whole bunch of people over to Rome. And uh, we boarded a ship from um, the Adrianum, uh, Ad Adrantium, I don't, I don't really know. That's a really tough one to say. Uh, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Uh, so they obviously got, got on board outside of um, where they were there in Caesarea, and they were about to, to, to get out there and, and, and set sail. Uh, Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. I uh, found that interesting to find he's in two other places in some of the Pauline writings. He's in Colossians 4.10 and verse 24 of Philemon. So we see this guy appear a few times in the New Testament. Uh, the next day we landed at Sidon and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus. All right, let me, uh, I don't know hardly anything about sailing um, so, but I, this word Lee kind of pops up a few times and let me just give you a little, uh, tidbit here so that you know what it's talking about. Uh, Lee is a nautical term. It, it means holding to a position, uh, not to the left or right or north or south, but holding to a position which offers shelter from the prevailing wind. All right. So yeah, cause I'm like, what does that mean? Uh, that's what that means. So they're, when they talk about the Lee, it means we're holding to a position that will keep the ship safe because of the wind and all the things going on. Okay. Um, ba, ba, ba. For, yeah, from there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in, in, in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for uh, Italy and put us on board. All right, so one of the um, commentaries I looked at for this, these ships that they're about to get on was a grain ship, huge ship. It was over 100 feet in length, and so they're about to hop board uh, onto this ship. So they, they climb aboard. Uh, we made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off of uh, Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed uh, to the Lee, there it is again, of Crete, opposing uh, Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Uh, much time had been lost and sailing had already come, uh, become dangerous because now it was after the fast. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, the fast was the Day of Atonement. So I, I looked this up as well because I'd you know, circle questions and, and try to find out what they mean. Uh, this was after the Day of Atonement, and the Day of Atonement was in the early fall, right around the first part of October. It was really interesting in, in the Mediterranean world right there, if, if you knew anything about uh, the seas, you knew um, the word was, if it was after, this is really interesting, I found, if it was after September 14th, and you were trying to go the route that they were going, Everyone knew this was not a smart route. Very, very dangerous after September uh, 14th. But if it was after, um, where is it? There it is. If it was after November 14th, it was impossible uh, to get where you needed to go. 
All right, so um, what we're understanding, and we know, again, this is first person, so Luke is with him. All right, uh, I think this is the fourth time that appears, so Luke is with him. Um, and, and everyone understood in the original context, like, this is a crazy route that they're heading. This is why Paul begins to speak up, because he was a smart guy. All right, um, so Paul warned them, because it was after the fast, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and also to our lives. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship, since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in. And the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix, um, not our Phoenix, sorry, uh, and winter there. Uh, this was the harbor at Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. Okay, uh, verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought that they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the Lee, okay, there it is the third time, that's why I looked it up, uh, passed to the Lee, um, now I just lost my place, there it is, of a small island called uh, Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of um, Syrtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent um, battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw, off cargo, throw cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. All right, so this is pandemonium. All right, if you're not picking up on this, um, everything is going wrong. People are freaking out. Um, there's a lot of people we're about to find out from Luke on this boat. They're throwing stuff overboard. This is this is like a Mediterranean cruise gone bad, okay? Not good at all. Um, you ever watch Deadliest Catch? I love, love that show. That's one of the shows I tape. I love watching that show. So that's kind of the image I have in my mind, like when they're just getting destroyed out on sea. All right. Um, on the third day, uh, th yeah, we already read that. Verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and storm conditions uh, raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. They're like, we're going to die. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, so uh, some scholars believe they were fasting to like, hopefully this will, God will hear us if we fast. All right, so that's kind of what they're doing there. Men, you should have taken my advice. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I love it. Ca uh, Paul being Captain Obvious right there. Uh, guys, you should have taken my advice. Uh, yeah, obviously. Uh, you know, not to not to sail not to sail from Crete. Uh, then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, uh, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God who I I love this part. Last night, get this, an angel, verse twenty three, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me. Is that powerful or what? And he said, do not be afraid. By the way, there's a little fun fact. 366 times in the, in, this, in, the, in the text from Genesis to Revelation, we get this command from God to not be afraid. One for every day and then a little a bonus for leap year. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground and uh, on some island. All right, verse 27. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors, since they were approaching land, they took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, soundings again and found that it was 90, deep, 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors left the lifeboat into the sea, uh, let the lifeboat into the sea, pretending they were going uh, to lower some anchors for the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, "Unless these men stay with the ship, they cannot be. You cannot be saved." So the soldiers cut the ropes, uh, held the lifeboat, and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last fourteen days, he says, "You have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food." Uh, you, you need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, um, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. 
Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. So Luke uh, and letting us know, I mean, there's a ton of people on board. When they'd eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. So again, they were on this grain uh, ship um, heading. So they, they tried to lighten the load, throw it into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea. At the same time, untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made uh, for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Verse 42, home stretch. The soldiers planned to kill the, the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered that those could swim, uh, those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. This is the word of God. We just have one more chapter tomorrow, and we will complete our 28-day journey. And we've been seeing all kinds of crazy things happen in the book of Acts, unexpected things. And, you know, to a degree, I don't necessarily think this is uh, what God is necessarily the theme of Acts or what Luke is trying to convey. But what I'm getting from it is just the, uh, the different seasons of life, things that you do not expect, things that you have not anticipated, things that you have not planned for. And all of a sudden you find yourself for 14 days in the middle of a storm where you can't even see daylight. Some of you right now are exactly in that place. You know, it hasn't been 14 days. It's It's been like two years. Maybe it's been 14 years where it's as if you haven't even seen the light of day. Your life has been, you know, tossed back and forth. The, the headwinds are piercing and, and preventing you from moving forward, or at least it feels that way. Uh, you haven't seen land in a long time. You're not even sure which direction you're going, if you're going north or south or east or west. In essence, the storm of life is, is, is overwhelming right now for you. And I've certainly been in seasons like that. And some of you right now, this is exactly where you're at. Maybe if it's not you, maybe someone really close to you is in exactly that kind of season. What I'm taking from the text, one, is, man, you never know um, when you're, we're going to be in a storm. But it's something that I wrote down here, and it's this, and this is what I want to encourage you with. In times of change, cling to the one who is unchanging. Or let me say it this way. In times of uncertainty, cling to what is certain. And what we are certain of is this, is that there is a king who is sitting on the throne. I'm telling you, it's in times and seasons of storms like this where we have to trust and stand on the sovereignty of God. And this is exactly what Paul is doing. He, his footing was sure, even in turbulent waters. His footing was sure because he understood that God had things in control. The, the, the seat of the throne was not vacant. No, it, it was filled. God is sitting there on the throne and everything is under his control. And I want to encourage you this morning to cling to him. It's an uncertain time. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to cling to what is certain. God has not forgotten about you. He sees you. He knows exactly who you are and the situation that you are in. It's times of change right now. Things are changing in an unexpected way. I want to encourage you to cling to the one who is unchanging. His word is clear. He does not change. He is immutable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Have a great, great Saturday. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning as we dive into the final chapter. God bless.